Reinbaltz, and this is Wrap, a live show from the storefront window of the DKNY shop at 420 West Broadway. Over eight weeks, I'm interviewing leading female contemporary artists living and working in New York City on their recipes for art and design. And that is what RAP stands for, Women, Recipes, Art, and Process. And today, I have the incredible honor of sitting next to the woman who made it happen because <laughs> RAP is part of a commission series that has been uh, founded between DKNY and New Inc., the new museum's incubator for art, design, and technology. And sitting next to me is Julia Kagansky, the director of New Inc. And Julia, I have this uh, wonderfully, embarrassingly prestigious bio I'm going to read for everyone who doesn't know who Julia is. So as I said, she's the director of New Inc. and is a recognized cultural producer across the art and technology fields. She previously served as global editor of the Creators Project, a partnership between Vice Media Group and Intel, and founded Arts Tech Meetup, a group that brings together professionals from New York City's museums, galleries, art-related startups, and digital artists. She's also been cited by Fast Company and Business Insider as one of the most influential women in technology, and news to me, profiled in the 2012 AOL PBS series, Makers Honoring Women Leaders an impressive bio, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, even though I'm not an artist. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think, as I said before, is our point of conversation mm -hmm. today. And I know something that has been on your mind recently is the role of the artist and the role of the artist in the city. Mm -hmm. So tell me what's been on your mind as, I think, as defined as a cultural producer, but maybe in a wider lens. How are you seeing artists in today's landscape? Yeah, I mean, so my path has been uh, somewhat unconventional, and my interests in the work that artists do and creative practitioners more broadly, um, I think sits outside of the somewhat more uh, conventional notions of uh, and spaces where we encounter art, like galleries and museums. Um, even though I now currently work at a museum, I work in the space next door and run an incubator, which is uh, entirely new uh, activity for museums to be engaged in. And many of the folks who are part of the New Inc. program are exploring uh, different applications of their creative output, um, some of which take the form of product design, some of which take the form of uh, performances, experiences, um, social engagement, community engagement. And um, I recently just got back from Athens, Greece, uh, where the new museum was uh, staging uh, Idea City, which is a traveling festival looking at the role of culture in shaping the future of our cities um, and the role that you know artists, architects, urban planners, policy makers um, have and what bringing them together in dialogue can do. And you know there was first of all some very inspiring talks from artists like Jana Comfra, um, Tanya Bruguera, uh, Hito Sterl, and I don't know I'm increasingly interested in this concept of the artist as citizen um, and how that manifests uh, in some cases as forms of activism, as forms of um, community engagement, um, social practice, um, but also how that starts to manifest in the form of organizations, um, either nonprofit or social enterprise, or even you know for-profit organizations that are mission-driven, which is um, what I think many of the folks at New Inc are doing as well. Yeah, where did this interest begin? Because it feels so human-centric, mm. and I think is such a departure from a classic curatorial practice, let's say museum practice, but also seems to be so prevalent in the contemporary world as we move forward. Is there some genesis in that for you? I mean, I think one of the things that uh, really inspired me was as much as I loved, um, you know, going to museums when I was a kid and 
seeing the objects. It was learning about the people and the um, social scenes that they were a part of and their stories and what they were trying to, um, the conversations that they were trying to bring into the world that resonated the most with me. And those were, you know, the entry points for me into appreciating the objects, you know, the paintings, the sculptures, um, whatever it was that was on view. And I think that's true of a lot of, um, arts patrons, especially people who aren't necessarily collectors or curators or people that have um, fluency in the world of art history, um, the human interest piece of it is often what uh, most engages audiences with works of art. But later on, I think um, this human element for me came um, out of my engagement with technology. Um, you know being thrust into uh, the startup scene in New York upon graduating from college and uh, being very much kind of unsettled uh, by how rapidly everything was changing um, and seeing new social dynamics and behaviors being formed um, in terms of, you know, you walk down the street and everyone's like this, um, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the, the social norms that yeah. come out of that, that interrelational aspect. Um, and wanting to explore that more and to understand that more and question that more and artists were some of the you know main voices that I saw entering into that space and investigating it with a very critical lens and that was something that I think um, sort of further stoked that interest in uh, that interrelational kind of human aspect of not only technology but the city as a technology itself in a way. Yeah. yeah it makes me think about when I learned I learned to draw and I only learned to draw when I learned to address negative space mm. so the space in between two lines the space in between two objects really became the artwork mm -hmm. and it I think is a way to think of what you're talking about in a similar way and something I know I mean my I'm deeply interested in that as well I think that's why we're sitting here together on the subway bench what do you think now about that this space is actually becoming the commodity, whereas mm -hmm. before it was the object, it was the image, mm -hmm. perhaps it was a performance mm -hmm. as well. But what does that mean now as we move forward into, I think, slightly different economic landscape, new funding platforms? I know that's something that you've reflected on a lot, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you see the shift happening in both the spaces of um, the most commercialized spaces and also the least commercialized spaces. And by that I mean um, in this day and age of, you know, social media, but also um, consumerism, um, oftentimes the most prized uh, thing that you can own or purchase is an experience, a unique experience, right? Um, and this is increasingly true as the cost of commodities starts to uh, approach zero, like in the space of, say, music, right? You don't spend as much money on a CD or a vinyl record or a tape <laughs> or anything like that anymore, but concerts. Um, have become the main way to kind of consume music. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think many artists have been questioning uh, the market, uh, the kind of fetishization of objects, um, and trying to circumvent that, I mean, through things like performance art, the, the kind of move towards immaterial and conceptual work, um, and this, recent trend or I would say past decade or two of um, social practice um, that is entering into communities and I think a big part of that also has come out of um, a move towards being more inclusive, more diverse, more accessible mm -hmm. in the culture sector where um, you know people have been challenging the white male uh, narrative of art and uh, trying to reach out into communities that um, don't see themselves as 
uh, being part of the discourse or, or even uh, being welcome in arts institutions typically. So it's trying to um, extend an olive branch, build bridges and, and um, demonstrate to the people in these communities that they have a voice, that they have something to contribute um, as well. What is the role of technology in that? Do you think it plays a part? in the deconstruction and mm. reconstruction? I think technology can potentially uh, increase accessibility um, on a global scale, right? So um, you can build bridges uh, between communities that are distributed in space and time but can still be connected uh, via technology. Um, I think technology is another area where access is an issue and, um, you know, there's actually this year at New Inc. an arts organization, a nonprofit that is teaching um, digital arts tools and skills to uh, underprivileged teenagers. It's like an after school program. So there are free classes in things like, um, you know, Photoshop and Adobe After Effects, but also, you know, in creative coding, um, which is important because it gives. Uh, not only practical skills, but also um, a different entry point into these practical skills so that you can imagine how to use them in ways that are not just about, you know, building a website and doing uh, systems administration for some conglomerate, but also using these same skills in much more expressive um, human ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, tell me how you would um, like, what sort of would your utopia be as we evolve into this new landscape of, it feels like listening to you, open technologies, mm -hmm. emerging of disciplines, and, and this artist as citizen. Mm -hmm. Is there something that is sort of your call to action of what you want to put forth in the world? Yeah. Um, I think the question of ethics it's, is one that's been coming up for me a lot. Um, and it came up actually in some of these presentations in Athens at Idea City. Um, and to me that's about, you know, as much of, about the way that we relate to each other within our communities um, and as people of different cultural groups. Um, that was a conversation that came up a lot in Athens right now. Obviously, sure. there's the refugee crisis yeah. and you know who has a right to be there and what um, how do we uphold people's basic human rights as they become displaced and whose responsibility is that and what is our role and all of these like very difficult questions to which there is no simple answer. Um, but these questions are also often absent in uh, the development of technology. So one of our advisors at New Inc, Kate Crawford, is really interested in the ethics of data and privacy, which is the conversation that we're most uh, present to because of Snowden and all of that. But what does that mean for things like artificial intelligence and the way that these new technologies are evolving robotics? I have a friend at MIT who uh, studies robot ethics. So, you know, this question of um, what are the new codes by which we live? Um, as a society that start to emerge. And I think artists do a really good job of investigating that. Yeah. Speaking of codes, and I know that this is obviously a contextual question as well, but the, the codes that are attached to the word female. Mm. And I think as we see a completely fluid gender landscape emerging in front of us, how do you, is there a way that you begin to define that word or that you see it being defined around you right now? Um, I think some of the most um, powerful explorations of female or the things that are associated with it that I think are most um, relevant and things that should be emphasized are um, things like empathy, nurturing, healing, um, these are 
qualities that um, are typically associated with women that I think we could use more of in mm -hmm. society today. And um, I'm hopeful that uh, in this gender fluidity, some of these characteristics that have typically been sort of you know, isolated as like female characteristics can be disseminated and distributed through society more broadly um, in a way that, you know, makes us maybe a little bit more compassionate. Yeah. I'm also really curious to, when you see, I mean, you see a myriad of work all mm -hmm. over the world. And is there, and you also have this amazing ability to, I think, to synthesize the fine art world with the commercial world. Mm. I think part of this is an interesting example of that. Is there a certain role that the arts plays across all these spe all, all these spectrums? Do you see it as uh, being a voice of the people? Do you see it as stimulating emotion? I'm curious mm -hmm. in terms of just your definition of how you see art affecting the world around us. I mean, art is a mirror of culture as a reflection of culture and um, that can be you know the collective memory of culture it could be um, the new kind of social norms and and dynamics that are emerging um, one of the things that i'm obviously very interested in is how technology is helping to shape culture um, today um, and uh, the other thing that I think art does really well is drill down into the kind of essence of um, what makes us human, what is the essence of our collective culture as human beings, right? Um, and I think that that almost anthropological investigation of humanity, both what it was and what it is and what it will be, is um, one of the most exciting threads that art plays in different contexts. Yeah, and looking forward, I think mm. this is such a great question when you touch upon artificial intelligence, robotics, like mm -hmm. what it means to be human is a very present question mm -hmm. in technology. Yeah. What do you think it, this is a, I, this came to me, this is not at all a prepared question, <laughs> but what do you think it takes to make something human? Mm. I think about this yeah. all the time. So I'm really curious, and I know that I even use vocabulary like, that's so human, that person is so human. What does that mean to you? Right. Um, that's a really good question. I think um, something that feels really human, I think for me also has an element of maybe humility, um, maybe some humor. I'm just like thinking of all of the root words <laughs> that the, are associated great with human. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, tapping into a feeling, um, an emotion, a feeling, um, things that can't necessarily be verbalized, um, but are familiar when you encounter them. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And it, I feel like I almost don't have the right language to talk about it. Yeah, I often confront this. Yeah. It's I would rather like grunt and shake or something mm. and define what that is. But for now, this is our medium of right. universal communication, mm -hmm. <laughs> seemingly so. I, I don't know why, but like me going mm right now just made <laughs> me think of... Um, there's a really great piece that this artist, Rashad Newsom, does. Um, I'm totally blanking on the name of it right now. Um, but it's essentially a performance where he's using uh, the sounds and expressions and gestures of um, shade, like black women in, in communities, like throwing shade at one another. And it's like, mm like snap like you know and and that to me is like an example of something that's like so human because you don't you understand it implicitly um without any words exchanged it's like a look it's a gesture it's a it's a grunt mm -hmm. it's it's this thing that is um kind of almost encoded in our in our dna yeah if 
it seems like you have followed a very human path when I hear you talk about, mm. I think, the way that your curiosity has led you to this space. Was there some feeling that kept you on this, on this path? Because you've achieved so much in so little time. <laughs> I think often we all, we all have to be reminded of that, so I'm right. reminding you. <laughs> but what was that feeling throughout this whole time? You know, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, um, I've, for most of my life, had this sense of momentum, of being, like, propelled in a direction, and it wasn't even always the direction that I thought it was going to be, um, because I was, like, very hell-bent on being a magazine journalist from the age of 14, and initially that sense of inertia was driving me in that direction where, you know, I was pursuing something very doggedly, but also opportunities were kind of presented to me that, you know, felt almost like, you know, the hand of fate intervened. <laughs> and um, this was especially, I think, the case that momentum accelerated in a profound way for me when I started looking at this intersection of art and technology. And it was kind of like, you know, you start pulling on a thread and it unravels faster and faster and faster. And all of a sudden, like, the landscape keeps changing the more that you know. And that, at the end of the day, you know, is what drives me, this, like, quest for understanding um, and trying to find a sense of purpose for myself um, in this shifting landscape, um, but ultimately to try to uh, get a sense of where things are going and, and how I can have a hand in making some sort of positive contribution to... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this Wanting also to sounds like an art form. I will slip that in there. Oh, really? Yeah, in a very beautiful way. <laughs> so in the unraveling, this is a good segue. I've been making everyone a wrap, so you have to mm. unravel oh, wraps. Yeah, you, we've also been accosted by the UPS man. Uh, so I've made you a wrap that was inspired by you and your love of vegetables. I also call it rainbow bomb because it is a bomb. So this is meant uh, in a new form. <laughs> it looks a little bit disguised like a, a liquor bottle, but it's not. It's a wrap. <laughs> so it's filled with veggies. It's also, I think, ready to just be exploded into the world. And mm -hmm. that is what I think that you've contributed. It's helped us all see the world through so many different colors. So let this be like a delicious parting gift, parting gift for thank this you. wonderful conversation. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And we are back. And for this delicious wrap. <laughs> I need a whole show of like the eating of the wraps yes, next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we are here every Tuesday and Thursday in the storefront window of the DKNY shop from September 8th until October 27th, 2016.